Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Matthew chapter 5. We're continuing our series on simple obedience. We've come to this part of these antitheses where Jesus is speaking about these next two, a living out publicly of our faith and what that means to follow him. He says this in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand your coat over as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. In high school, Tia and I actually attended the same high school. We were high school sweethearts. Uh, We attended a a smaller Christian high school, and uh, our English teacher was a former college professor and kind of uh, later in her career was teaching at the Christian school level, and she was very strong in paper writing and also in literature. That was her background, and so uh, probably like many of you, we we read all sorts of different kinds of books and literature uh, in our high school experience, and Typically, it was in more classic Western literature, and some of those were very boring books, I have to admit. But there were also some really good ones in there as well. We had to read Les Miserables. We had to read, our favorite in high school was The Count of Monte Cristo, Alexander Dumas' great tale. And one of the reasons that that story, is also the writer of The Three Musketeers, was it was adventure, it was action. And if, if you re- recall that story, either from having read the novel or having seen the various adaptations in movie form that that novel has been turned into, it's an incredible adventure and action story. It's ultimately a revenge story of this man, Edmond Dante, who had been taken advantage of and had been basically wrongly accused and then conspirit cons- conspiracy was used by these individuals basically to ruin this man's life and he found himself in prison unjustly condemned with no hope of release and eventually with the help of another who was in there they plot to get him to escape from that prison and a fortune is turned over to him and he becomes the infamous Count of Monte Cristo and then enters into Parisian society and exacts his revenge on each of those conspirators who brought him down. And one by one, he systematically takes them out. It's an incredible story of revenge. And we like those kinds of stories. They resonate with us. This is why... We love adventure and action movies. We like that kind of entertainment. And usually, most action and adventure movies and tales have some sort of revenge being played out on a very evil person, making sure they get to what's coming to them. There's a movie franchise that just had one of its latest installments come out this week, which is completely a tale of revenge in the most violent of ways, and people flock to those kinds of movies. But for a minute, try to think of a movie in which the hero or the heroine of the story is wronged, yet in the end does not retaliate, but gives in to the enemy, allowing the enemy to win. How many of us have seen movies, action-adventure movies like that? Probably very few of us. Because they don't make movies like that. We don't want to see the good guy in the end lose. We want to see him win. And that's usually accomplished through some sort of, 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 of mental strategy or physical power, defeating the enemy, forcing the destruction of the bad guy. In fact, this is so ingrained in us that we typically cheer when the bad guy is defeated and 
We really cheer when he gets killed in the end. That's ultimate resolution. But what Jesus teaches here to those who were gathered to hear his Sermon on the Mount, he teaches something for his followers that is the exact opposite of that. That's what he teaches. So as we unpack this teaching, let's look at what was eye for eye, what was tooth for tooth, how was that understood in Jesus' day, and then what does he do with that passage? The understanding of this and the the righteousness that the Pharisees would have promoted in Jesus' day, especially in legal matters, was this, when wronged, seek equal justice. When wronged, seek equal equal justice. This teaching isn't found directly in the Ten Commandments, but it it occurs over and over in the Old Testament under the the law of retribution, the law of retaliation. In, In Latin, this is called the lex talionis, retribution, justice. And it occurs in the Jewish law of the Torah. Just listen to a few of these verses, or if you want to turn back to them, Leviticus chapter 24, verses 19 and 20 says this, anyone who injures their neighbor is to be injured in the same manner, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The one who has inflicted the injury must suffer the same injury. This is repeated over in Deuteronomy chapter 19. This is the more, this is the fuller text. Listen to this, verses 15 to 21. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And if a malicious witness takes the stand to accuse someone of a crime, the two people involved in the dispute must stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges who are in offense or who are in office at the time. The judges must make a thorough investigation, and if a witness proves to be a liar giving false testimony against a fellow Israelite, then do to the false witness as that witness intended to do to the other party. You must purge the evil from among you. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid. There's the rationale for why you would do this, to bring about fairness and to bring about justice within the land. And they will never again, never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Listen to these operative words. Show no pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The point of the Old Testament law was to deter crime from occurring in the land by showing people by eye for eye, tooth for tooth justice, that justice would be meted out for crimes committed and punishment would fit the crime. Now by the time we get to Jesus' day, This gets changed up a bit. You didn't go to court and they started hacking off limbs because somebody injured someone else. Typically wasn't done that way. Typically why Jesus' day was done through a fine system. There would be payments for injury caused. But as this text and these Old Testament texts were read and interpreted, many Jewish people understood the mandate as a, a, a... commissioning of revenge. Not through retaliation so much, but through court system. Take the person to court, sue them so that justice is meted out and equality is reached. The rationale again was to uphold justice. But such a system very quickly moves toward a merciless one. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Where does mercy fit into that? Further, the Jewish courts in Jesus' day held very little power because they were not independent. They were under Roman law. And so Roman law also ruled as well. And so an individual was left many times with no recourse but to take matters into their own hands to seek sort of a vigilante justice. 
And again, there's something about a vigilante justice when it's, when it's dealing with evil for good that resonates with us. We like that stuff. This is pretty much the point of any Western, if you've ever watched those kind of movies. The law isn't doing their job, so we have to take matters into our own hands and set things right. That was the mindset of the people. So Jesus' words come into that sort of a scenario. When there is injustice, what do we do? And Jesus' statements here would have shocked his audience, just like they shock us today. Jesus' simple obedience that we are to follow today, his command is this, never retaliate. Do not resist an evil person. Jesus is saying, never take matters into your own hands. The word resist here, that he says, do not resist, carries the idea of standing against something, to to go against, to resist. And this is an incredibly shocking statement by Jesus because it goes against our, I think, the very fabric of us, our very nature as humans. We want in the least to make things right, to set things right. In the worst, and I think when our flesh is brought into the equation, we want vengeance. We want things set right, and we want to exact that. I mean, think about what you have to teach the little boy, some of the first lessons he has to learn. Do not hit back, right? My mom tells the story of, of toddler Philip having to learn that because the little boy was messing with my stuff, and so I took my little hammer and I hit him on the head. Don't mess with my stuff. But that's what we do, right? That's in us to go back, to retaliate. Jesus commands that such action is wrong and his followers should not be characterized as those who retaliate. His command is for no retaliation and this is so well played out in the Garden of Gethsemane as Peter pulls out a sword and he tries to resist the arresting of Jesus. And what does Jesus tell him to do? Put your sword away. Mike, this is not what my kingdom is about. His followers are to submit to the evildoer. His followers are to seek ways to give to the evildoer rather than to take from them. And that's the illustrations, the four next commands that he gives us throughout the rest of 39 down through 42. Simple obedience in action. What does that look like? What does it look like to obey Jesus in this? How do we put this into practice? He's telling us here, practice non-resistance. Don't resist an evil person. So what does non-resistance look like? You see, over the past decades in American culture, I think this has played out, especially through the 50s, the 60s especially, and then all the way up to today, non-violent protest has become a way to let one's voice be heard without violently responding. But in our more recent history, Even nonviolent protest has morphed into destructive and violent protest at times. The ideal remains still nonviolence. But Jesus' words stop Jesus' words don't stop short. Nonviolence stops short of what Jesus says here. Jesus goes beyond simple nonviolence. Yes, don't retaliate, but the illustrations that he give us call his followers into actions that go beyond just nonviolent protest of actual giving and doing toward the evildoer. You see, nonviolent protest isn't going to do what Jesus calls his followers to emulate of his own actions and teachings here. How are we to live this out? How do we practice non-resistance?
first of all, we take what I call humiliation here. We take it. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. Turning the other cheek addresses an individual who was being publicly insulted. To slap someone on the right cheek, that would be my right cheek, right, would typically done by, be done by the strong hand of the other person. But if they reached out and slapped with their right hand, they would hit me on the left cheek. So this implies even the backhanded slap across the face, which in Jewish society was even more of an insult. If, if this was done, you could even get more out of the person if you took them to court. But rather than retaliation or striking back or suing because of the public insult, Jesus calls his followers here to place themselves in an even more vulnerable and humiliating position. Don't just allow them to do that. Turn to them the other cheek. Let them strike you again if he or she so desires. I don't know about you, but that is not how I typically would respond to insult. The flesh starts boiling up. Something's coming out. That's how we want to respond to that. Jesus says, no. That's not how my followers are to respond when they are publicly insulted. How do you respond when somebody publicly wrongs or shames you? When that person says something in a group that is directed at you, even if it's kind of offhandedly directed at you, and you know that that is an insult to you. How do you respond? Typically, we, wanna, we, might, we might walk away from it, but we're festering, and we're going to figure out some way to come back at them at some point. That's what we do. And yet Jesus says no. Our natural impulse wants to explode on them, and yet Jesus says no. Turn to them the other. Secondly, the second illustration, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Jesus says, allow the loss of your comforts and necessities. This is a legal lawsuit, and there are one's rights that are protected by law in Jesus' day and in our day today. But Jesus' illustration Concerns somebody being sued in a court over their shirt. They don't have any money, and so what do they have? This first garment, the shirt, would be the basic clothing that one would wear next to their body. But the second garment that Jesus says to be handed over, the coat as well, is the outer garment. That was the much more important piece of clothing in that day. It was the source of protection from the elements. It was the covering of the common person. The person who did not have much could use that outer coat as their blanket. In fact, that's what they would sleep under to keep them warm at night. And in the context of this legal matter, Jesus admonishes his followers, don't just take off your shirt, give them your coat as well. This isn't just a a want or a, a... a comfort. Jesus is saying, give even of what you absolutely need for your protection. Give it to him. Jesus challenges us as his followers to go as far to even give our most cherished possessions to the one who is wrongly going after our things. And if you play Jesus's illustration out to its logical conclusion, this would leave the person who's being sued standing before the court of the law basically in their underwear. They've lost their clothes. They've lost their outer court. I mean, their outer coat in the court. How do you respond when someone is coming after you? I mean, I, 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 where's my rights, right? Like, that's, that's the thought that we have. We're going to fight back. Jesus calls us beyond this. He uses a third illustration. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. He's stating here to allow yourself to be taken advantage of even by powerful people. 
This is a military scene. You see, the Jews in Jesus' day were under Roman control, and one of the rights that a Roman soldier had was any of the states over which they had control, those citizens, in a sense, could be called into at any point service for the military to do their bidding, to do whatever task they asked of them. And sometimes this meant that the person had to carry a burden for the soldier a certain distance. You see this played out in Jesus' own walk to crucifixion, right? Where Simon is called into action to come alongside him and help carry the load. He was conscripted into service. Jews in Jesus' day despised this because it showed in a very public way that this person was under the control of the Romans. That we were, in a sense, inferior to these more powerful people. And in this situation, Jesus calls his followers not to complain, but to offer to carry the burden, not simply the requested amount, but go two miles, double it. What does it look like in our lives when we are taken advantage of in work, either by a coworker who thinks they're more powerful than us, right? Or even a boss, where we are being mistreated or things are not being done fairly or we are doing more than should be expected. How do we respond? Typically, the advice we would hear or give is don't let them walk all over you. Or you have your rights, you should fight for those. Implying that you should do something to make sure this is set straight. That's not Jesus' advice. And lastly, he uses one further illustration that teaches us that we are to be unquestionably generous at our own expense. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who who wants to borrow from you. His teaching here is describing two uncomfortable scenarios that we might face in our everyday lives. How do you respond when somebody comes and begs from you? Or how do you respond when somebody borrows from you or borrows from you and doesn't repay what they borrowed from you? Jewish law allowed for help of the poor, but Jesus' statements here go beyond that. To give to either group, either the borrower or the one who is begging, without worrying about their motive or what they intend to do with the money. Jesus' words actually suggest that we aren't to judge the merit of the request or how the person is going to use it. We are simply to give it to them. The impetus for the call to these actions, and this is what I think Jesus is driving at here, is that his disciples, his followers, Christ followers, should be willing to give generously without reservation to those who are in need. So how do you respond when you see that person who's standing on the side of the road begging for money? We usually don't make much eye contact, right? We sit in the, both hands now on the steering wheel looking straight ahead. We rationalize that they're going to spend it on alcohol, so why give it to them anyways? We've seen enough exposés on this to realize they're probably a fake, you know, go get a job. I mean, that's typically our response, right? How do you live out this command in that scenario? I would say be prepared, right? I think a great illustration of how to do this is have something in your car that you can give to them. His point is we are not to retaliate or even think about how do I protect my own interests. Rather, we should seek to help those in need without care of whether or not it will be repaid to us. 
We are servants of Jesus Christ. Servant implies that we serve all who are in need. As far as the lending of money, when you lend someone money, you don't receive it back in a timely manner. I would suggest you stop dwelling on it. If you're going to lend, anticipate, at least in the back of your mind, that you might not get this back, and that's okay. Or don't lend the money. We are to use common sense, I think, in this. But when you have given, don't expect return. That's Jesus' statement to us. So all of these illustrations, what are they driving at? How do we live this out today? I think the main idea of what Jesus is saying here is this. In the face of injustice, his followers find ways to act graciously to those who intend evil toward them. It's very interesting if you go back to that word evil. In verse 39... Because in verse 37, it's the exact same expression. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one or comes from evil. And then when he talks about this eye for eye and tooth for tooth, we are not to resist the evil one. Not Satan here, but the evil doer. Same expression. So does this mean that we just excuse sin, just overlook sin, allow sin to rule and reign in our day. I don't think that's what Jesus is suggesting here. It doesn't mean we excuse sin or evil. Sin or evil must be checked. Ultimately, sin and evil will be punished when Jesus Christ returns. But I think what Jesus is challenging his followers with, and he's challenging us with, is to not seek personal retribution and retaliation. There might be times that God uses an individual to enact justice. Some of you are involved in law enforcement, right? That's something instituted by law, by the government, by something God says in Romans 13, he gives the power to, to make sure that there is justice. Might be a We might have judges that are Christians and those that are in in law in general and that they're part of that system. That's why the government is there. But I should seek, this is Jesus' point, I should seek to combat wrongs that are done to me through acts of service and good deeds that show there is a better way. That's Jesus' command. That there is a better way, even to those who have wronged me. Take your Bibles here real quick. Jump over to Romans chapter 12. One of these years, maybe in the more near future, we're going to preach through the book of Romans. The difficulty with the book of Romans, it'll take us the better part of a year to get through, right? This is a big, loaded book. But we do want to preach it at some point. But many times when Romans gets preached, you divide it up so much that you miss how some of this stuff flows together in a singular reading of it. Chapter 12, verse 17, the great passage on vengeance and revenge. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. We leave that in God's hands. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will reap burning coals on his head. Operative verse here that's so appropriate to our text today. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And normally that's where the sermons are going to end and our readings are going to end, and then the next week we'll come back on Romans 13. But Paul immediately moves into this in the letter. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. And then he goes on to talk about why God has instituted government. God's solution, Christian, is to leave that in those hands. 
Not to repay evil with evil, but with good and allow the government to do its God-given task. My confidence in God, my following of Jesus Christ and his kingdom ethics should be such that God uses right actions in my life to show others the error of their ways and be drawn into his kingdom. That's what Jesus is hitting at here. So that in the face of injustice, when I'm personally wronged, I am to find ways to act graciously to those who intend evil toward me. Now last week as we closed, we had a what about section in our sermon. We're going to have a what about section today. Because this, this teaching by Jesus raises all sorts of questions on how do Christians apply this today? How do we live this out? What about a context, and this is the first one I'll deal with, where there is an unjust government, where, where the government has gone wrong? Or what about a context in which we live today, and I know some of us think the government's gone way wrong, but a, a context today in which we have personal freedom We have a voice. We have a right, correct? Something that the Jews in Jesus' day did not have. You didn't have personal rights like this, at least under Roman law. You're you're under their authority. Not the freedom that we have today. What do we do with this? Our context does give us a voice and the ability to stand up for and alongside the oppressed. And so we should do that. We should use our voice, use our abilities to vote Christians to get on local boards so that justice and goodness and the influence of righteousness has a voice when we can voice it. That should be something Christians do within their community. Not just complain about how bad it is, but actually use the voice that we have toward this system of government. I think New Testament Christians would have done that given that kind of a voice. Recognizing at the same time that if you voice that in this context today, you do come up against institutional evil that wants to silence you. They're going to scorn you. They are going to ridicule. They are going to make fun of you as a Christian. They want nothing to do with that. And so it will be pushed against. You'll probably be slandered. Things falsely said against you. And then you can live out what Jesus says in this text. But use the voice that you have. What about military service? What about just war theory? Church history has provided the underpinnings for just war. That's where even today... Modern just war theory comes out of the philosophy and the theory and the thinking of much of the church fathers and then all the way down through many solid theological thinkers. At the same time, at almost all of those junctures in history, there was also another voice from within the body of Christ that was very pacifistic. And you can trace that line of thought all the way down to modern times as well. So which is right Here's my suggestion on this. This is how I personally wrestle with this. And I have a father who wrote a dissertation on just war theory in the thought of Augustine. And so he might have a different take on this, okay? But what governments do in these matters is part of God's ultimate plan about bringing his end to this world and its system, Do you guys remember when we preached through, some of you weren't here for this, but we preached the book of Revelation not that long ago, right? This past year. But what are the first two horses of not just the apocalypse, but as we understood the book of Revelation that describe this time leading up to the death of, or the the return of Jesus Christ after his death? How will that time be characterized? It will be characterized by a conquering foe that promises peace and yet at the same time is dominated by war. Is that a good thing? No. Is that part of God's kingdom? No. Will God use it though ultimately to bring about the end of human history? Yes. 
And so there's sort of the conundrum of the believer living today. But my question for us is this, which of the systems do we as followers of Christ belong to? Christ's kingdom, right? And we are to pursue that. So what would happen if a Christian, should Christians go into military service? That, that is something they are going to have to wrestle with, with passages like this, especially the teaching of Jesus and how that applies to their life. There are contexts where Christians might be even forced into military service. You could live in a country where it's required by law that you have to join the military for a certain period of time. We could have a situation where there's a draft again and Christians get drafted. I've wrestled with that in my own mind. How would I handle that? I I think I would probably go in and use where I'm at in life, I'm I'm past drafting age probably by now, but if that would happen, to go in and say, I am about the word of God, that is what I've been trained to, I will be a chaplain, you can put me on the front lines and put me in danger, but I'm going to speak of the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be a medic if I had to be a medic and give my life for my country in that way. I think this is a very difficult text is my point for that. And we need to individually wrestle with the implications of the fact that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. So let's take this a step further. What about personal protection and concealed weaponry? And again, I think this is a matter of personal conviction. But what I would strongly suggest is that even those who this is going to sound so bad, but even those who justify war and justify weaponry use much of the Old Testament to justify that because that's where it plays out in Scripture. Much of the rationale and the defense comes from Old Testament texts. And here's what a believer has to wrestle with today. To what extent did the coming of Jesus Christ and my following of him fulfill end and replace what the old covenant taught. Jesus is the end, Paul says in Romans 10, 4, of the law. Jesus, what he's saying here is, I know what you've heard said, but now I'm here, and this is what my followers are about. And I think these are matters to pray through and come to a very personal conviction on. But first and foremost, we must think about following Jesus' teaching and the example that he set for us as the primary resource how we make a decision in these matters. And I cannot help but find the response by communities like the Amish community when their school was attacked and their children were killed and the fact that they responded not with retaliation but with forgiveness to be an incredibly powerful testimony that our kingdom is not of this world, but it's of Jesus Christ. What about a coworker? What about a neighbor? What about when I'm personally being wronged? Listen, crimes and wrongs should be made known when they're criminal. They should be taken to the authorities. But rather than complain, rather than gossip, Jesus challenges us to extend grace to them. And more than just simply, and I think what a lot of people do, I'll just avoid them. Jesus doesn't say avoid them. Jesus says, go to them with grace and serve them. That's what he calls his followers to do. Many Christians' choices, as they make choices in these matters and other similar situations, reflect these these choices out of us reflect either a conviction or I think this is more likely a not thought through choice on our part thinking that what Jesus has said might be applicable to me personally but not necessarily what I have to live out in public that was very wordy but what I'm saying is I think a lot of people hear what Jesus has said here and says and think well if, if this is happening to me personally that's fine but if it's out in public or what I do in public that needs to be something different public Global, community, corporate response. 
But those seeking his kingdom first, I think, must wrestle with these statements, both in our personal lives and then how we live them out in our communities, how we live them out in our country. And I think a lot of us immediately think, how is this practicable? How, do we, how, do, how can you live this out today? That's impossible. Scott McKnight on his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount says this, and I found this very interesting this last week. He says, I cannot ask in the first instance if this is practicable. I am to ask in the first instance what it means to follow Jesus and what he says and commands. Jesus prevents his followers. This is the huge part of this. Jesus presents his followers with something that he embodied. Just listen to these verses from later in Matthew. Matthew chapter 26, verse 67. Then they spit in his face and they struck him with their fists and others slapped him and they mocked him. What did Jesus do? He took the humiliation. Flip over to chapter 27 and verse 35. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots for that outer garment. When Jesus died, he was stripped naked, just like he called his disciples to be. Give them everything. And ultimately humiliated. Jesus embodied absorbing injustice. He allowed it to come to him. He calls us to live out this same kingdom ethic today. Going back to our study in the book of Revelation, his own revelation, it's his revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it promises his followers that he himself will defeat evil and that our part in this defeat of Christ of evil in chapter 12 is stated this way, that we overcome evil, how? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony, not by us taking up arms and retaliating. We are to live out and speak the gospel and serve. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had to live this out in Nazi Germany, stated it this way in that exact context. Evil will, be o- evil will become powerless when it finds no opposing object, no resistance, but instead is willingly born and suffered Evil meets an opponent for which it is not a match when that's how it is absorbed. That's what Jesus did. That's how we overcome evil. Not with evil, but with good. By acts of service. And in a sense, this is the illustration in Romans 12, humiliating evil by heaping coals on that head through our good deeds. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a hard teaching. It grates against our very nature as not only humans, but Americans. But who do you follow? Whom do you follow? We follow Jesus Christ. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll read a closing benediction. If you have questions or need prayer over this, or something like that, I'll be right up here afterwards. Feel free to come up. If you want to yell at me, feel free to do that. And I'll practice my (laughs) non-resistance. But let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we come before you, having heard very, I think, difficult words from you but words that reveal what your kingdom is going to be all about. You will defeat evil, yes, and we are to leave that in your hands. I see no evidence anywhere in the book of Revelation where your followers are called to take up arms and defend. Rather, we get martyred. 
and you bring about justice. So Lord, help us to know how to live that out today. Help us to wrestle, help us to pray, help us to talk with one another. Help us not to make knee-jerk reactional choices, but to think about what it means to follow Jesus Christ and what he's calling us to here. And Lord, may we serve even the evildoer. Do good towards them. And may you, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, humiliatingly bring about conviction in those who witness such acts of non-resistance. Lord, may we be a church and a people who are characterized by overcoming evil with good. You did that for us, Jesus. You absorbed all of the suffering. You fill us with your spirit and he enables us to do the same. And may we not seek revenge, but Lord, may we look for how we can actively serve the good of the community in which you've placed us. To your glory, we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen.